So let's, let's start. I will be presenting Nathan Robinson in, uh, in English. He speaks fluently Spanish, but <laughs> he's going to give a talk in English, which is helpful for all of us, so we refresh. Uh, basically, I, I met Nathan because he uh, wanted to participate and expand his knowledge in uh, deep sea ecological studies. He's a very proficient researcher in, uh, a researcher in diffusion uh, uh, of problems of uh, sea conservation with a very strong trajectory in field activities and diffusion to social media and uh, huge portals and um, industries like uh, Netflix, uh, Night, uh, like uh, other, other type of companies that basically recruit him to uh, produce footages that some of those you will see here today. And uh, why we are very interested in Nathan's experience? Because basically, Nathan is using imaging to, uh, uh, let's say, portray a vanishing faunal component in the abyss, and in particular in the pelagic environment. So with this camera technology, is able to, uh, let's say, attract and somehow record the presence of uh, very important animal, top predators like giant squid and things like this, that to us are a very strong complement to integrate what we develop in the framework of our projects. So we have three projects, a, um, a life European project which, which is named Ecorest by Jose Maria Gili and uh, Jordi Grignot, which uh, is uh, centered on the restoration of cold water coral, soft body of the cold water corals into, into fishery depleted areas. So with the badminton, they uh, refurbish uh, the species and they accelerate the sediment trapping. And so the sediment trapping may uh, bring the, the biodiversity. And other two projects, which I will not state here because it's uh, for sh for, to be short, but Nathan will help us in monitoring the water column with our video camera on the seabed, with his video camera on the, on the water column itself. So, I quit here, and uh, <laughs> please. Gracias, Jacopo, y gracias a venir. Um, vale, puedo hablar un poco en, en castellano, pero no tengo el nivel suficiente a dar mi charla, y tampoco no puedo hablar en catalán. Entonces, lo siento, gracias por vuestra comprensión, pero I'm going to take this in English. <laughs> um, what I'm going to give you today is a talk about... It's really a talk about a chance encounter that led me to engage with millions of people worldwide on the issue of plastic pollution. That then led me down a path where I started using social media and viral videos to engage with ever larger audiences on the issue of ocean conservation. And I want to give you a little bit of experience to how I've done that, but also provide a couple of uh, lessons that I've learned during my journey. And then end by talking a little bit about what Jack Poe was mentioning, some of the work that I will hopefully be doing here as part of ICM. This is also a modified version of a talk that I've been giving recently over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and it's generally aimed at public audiences, um, so I understand that some of the information I probably find is a little bit simple for this specific audience, but thank you for bearing with me. Just to prove that it's a little bit more personal, this is a very young version of me. And I, I, bring, I usually bring up these slides as a way to talk to my audience about how important wildlife was to me as a child, but I think it's probably a similar story for many of people, many of the people in this audience. And like many of us, I grew up watching nature documentaries. I love them. I couldn't watch enough. But uh, after several years of them, basically my entire teenage life, watching documentaries, <clears throat> I was filled with, kind of, filled with passion for about two stories. Number one is I knew that the oceans were being threatened. And number two, I knew that I wanted to do something about it. So I did what I'm sure many of us have done, so I went to university to study marine biology. I actually went to the NOC in Southampton, and I had this expectation that from the day I started, I was going to be saving whales, sea turtles, all that incredible marine life that I'd been watching on all these documentaries, but instead it was mainly spent in a classroom, and that, that affected me. It's, I 
was, um, I was somewhat confused by the fact that all my professors knew so much about the issues facing our ocean, but we were never taught as students about how we could start to address that problem. So I decided to start volunteering instead, and specifically I went to Arklon, the Sea Turtle Protection Society of Greece, and I started working for them. With Arklon, we were walking up and down beaches of the Mediterranean looking for sea turtle tracks. And this is because sea turtles, although they're marine animals, nest on land. When we find the eggs, we would protect the eggs and monitor those nests until the hatchlings came to the surface and ran to the ocean a couple of months later. It felt very fulfilling to me, and I felt like I was really having a true conservation impact. So I threw myself at this work, and it eventually evolved into several other jobs elsewhere in the world. In Costa Rica, I started doing a PhD in sea turtle conservation that had me um, based in between South Africa and the US, and then uh, followed through by getting a postdoc that had me once again returning to Costa Rica. In each of those locations, I was working with nesting sea turtles. And while I found the work personally fulfilling, I was still troubled by I was seeing the same trends, population trends, at almost every single site we were working at. We were seeing massive declines in lots of these populations. And a good way to show this is in the bottom right-hand corner, here's a population graph from Parque Nacional Muino Les Paulas, Leatherback Turtle Marine Park in Costa Rica. This is an area where I spent about eight years of my life. And when they started monitoring this area back in the late 1980s, there were over 1,500 turtles nesting on this one stretch of beach that was about four kilometers long. And last year, they recorded just two animals. There was a decline of around 20% per year. And it really showed that all the work that was being done just protecting nesting animals wasn't enough. But this is actually something that scientists, and long before I even kind of started picking up a, a sea turtle textbook, knew. And we knew the main reasons why these populations were declining. And they were all global threats. Issues like fisheries bycatch, f commercial fisheries that are looking for species that we like to eat, swordfish, tuna, things like that, accidentally catching sea turtles in their nets or their long lines. Issues of plastic pollution with animals ingesting plastic that they mistake for the items that they eat. And climate change. And specifically for sea turtles, there's a two-fold impact here. Firstly, we have the fact that the hotter nests get, they tend to be less successful. So the hotter the nests are, they produce less hatchlings. And a second impact is that unlike humans, sea turtles don't have chromosomal sex determination. So for humans, you have two X chromosomes that produce, tends to produce female, and X and Y chromosome that tends to produce male. Sea turtles don't have this. They have a single chromosome that is kind of activated by temperature, with warmer temperatures producing females and colder temperatures producing males. So there's this extra impact of climate change leading to, potentially leading to, feminization of lots of sea turtle populations, which is, on a population status, unsustainable. Now, each of those issues, as I mentioned, is a global problem, and it's driven by, uh, and it will never be addressed by local conservation initiatives. Fisheries bycatch are driven, or fisheries are driven by global political and economic processes. Plastic pollution is driven by large corporations and our own personal consumption. Same goes for climate change. But in that, there's also uh, a silver lining to that cloud. There's that ray of hope, which is we can potentially have an impact as individuals in each one of those processes. Based on what we decide to eat, we can start to impact uh, where people decide to fish and how they fish. Whether we use plastic single-use items or alternatives can start to impact how much plastic's being delivered into our ocean. And whether we do simple things such as drive to work or bike to work or walk to work can start to impact <clears throat> climate change. So with that information, I actually started to switch away from my kind of field work on nesting beaches and started working in deliberation, started working in communication. I started organizing campaigns in several areas around the world to try to raise awareness about the different 
issues that we can protect ocean habitats. Started doing talks at high schools and infant schools, as many as I could. I would talk at public events. But <clears throat> I'd never really felt like I was achieving or reaching the large audience large audiences that this information really needs to get across to. But my strategy somewhat changed in one uh, day back in 2015. I had just been invited on a research expedition off the coast of Costa Rica um, by a friend of mine, Christine Figuerna, who was working for Texas NM University. Chris was specifically looking at olive ridley sea turtles and she was running an experiment to look at genetics, the relatedness between uh, different individuals in a reproductive aggregation. Because that meant to collect the samples for the genetics, we'd have to be handling these animals uh, directly on the boats. I used that as an opportunity myself to start a different project. And specifically, I was looking at epibionts, which are the animals that live on other animals. And sea turtles are a great example of these floating islands of biodiversity because they're covered in epibionts. You have leeches, barnacles, crabs, this huge diversity all tucked into the nooks and crannies, that's kind of small areas of these animals. So every time we'd pull uh, a turtle aboard the boat, I would start sampling these epibionts. And what's interesting to me about the epibionts is based on which epibionts each turtle have, you can start to provide some information about the feeding habitats, feeding habits of the animal, where they've been living, how healthy they are, some important ecological information. But for one specific individual, we found something quite unexpected. I thought that it had a tube worm that actually got lodged inside its nose. So I started to get my Swiss Army knife to try to remove the item. And luckily, Christine had the idea to grab her camera. This is a following video of what we found. As a quick warning, this is a bit of a distressing video, and I'm sure some of you have probably seen it already, uh, but I still think it's an important video to watch. That was the, the item that we found wedged in the animal's nose. What we initially thought was a tube worm was actually a plastic drinking straw. I'd love to say that that was the only one of those events that we found, but about two months later, I was continuing that project on a different area in Costa Rica, but only about 50 kilometers away, and this time we found something a little different. This time, the item we found lodged in the sea turtle's nose was a plastic fork. The first feeling I had in both instances was a, a, feeling of, a feeling of guilt. I've used plastic straws, I've used plastic forks, and not knowing where those items came from kind of felt like we were, well, we were all to blame, and I, I took that on myself. But I also started to wonder how were those animals, how were those items getting in there? And the obvious answer was from the fork. You see, the fork was, the head of the fork was actually wedged in the throat. So it's very unlikely that that, all that straw could have been stuck in from the outside. Instead, it was a lot more likely those animals are ingesting the plastic, trying to regurgitate them, and instead of passing back out the mouth, it's getting caught into the nose, or passing directly into the internal nares, which is that area where your throat, uh, with your nose, connects with the internal part of your throat. Sorry for the analogy, but it's like when you laugh when you're drinking and it fires out your nose, it's something similar. So, I did what any good scientist would do, is 
because people hadn't seen those events before, and it was a novel way that sea turtles were interacting with plastic, I wrote up that information in two scientific articles that I published in a very small journal called Marine Turtle Newsletter, describing our hypotheses as to how those, animal, how those items were getting caught in the sea turtles' noses. A few months ago, I looked up the first of those articles on ResearchGate, and it had almost 3,000 views, reads, which is, which is okay, but nothing huge. But I'm sure, as some of you know, that's not where the story ends. The night of the plastic straw, I made a quick post on my Facebook page talking about how this was the reality of the single-use world we live in and keeping our use of single-use items like plastics, uh, plastic straws, forks, this was the impact we're likely to see. That post ended up getting shared 32,000 times. Um, when you connect the amount of uh, shares we had from that post and the stuff on the fork, it exceeds over 60,000 shares. We've currently got around between those two videos, over 220 million views online, which is four or five times the population of Spain at this point. Uh, we were picked up by almost every single major news channel in the world, National Geographic, Al Jazeera, New York Times, El País. We were cited as being the inspiration for several anti-plastic campaigns and specifically anti-straw campaigns, the last straw movement, we skipped the straw. And it was even the focal point of a full-length documentary that was at the Sundance Film Festival a couple of years ago, inventively called Straws. So that's the level of our outreach, but what was the impact? And the impact was that straws and single-use plastics became a, a global conversation. One of my favorite memories was shortly after the straw video, I was getting a, a taxi in Costa Rica, and I remember the taxi driver telling me about this amazing video that his daughter was showing him. Um, and later that evening, I had a friend of mine who's in New York talking about how crazy it was that she was sitting on the subway, and people in front of her were talking about this straw video and how they're gonna never use straws again after seeing it. We started this global conversation. Before long, Straws and other single-use plastic items started getting banned in cafes, in restaurants, in counties, in provinces. Even entire countries were starting to ban single-use plastic items, often under the hashtag for the turtles. It was, it was an amazing moment that I'm incredibly proud to be part of. And um, yeah, it was just a wonderful moment that really started to show me how we can interact with really large audiences and engage them in marine conservation. So, still being a marine biologist, I started to wonder, how can I use this information? How can I use this new tool for global outreach in the rest of my research? And I came up with a simple answer, which was to start inc incorporating camera technologies into all the stuff I was doing moving forward. The idea being that if I can start using cameras, I can both answer important ecological questions while simultaneously generating the footage that I need to use for global engagement. The next section of my talk, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an insight into three programs where we've been incorporating cameras into our research. Firstly, in drones. Secondly, using animal-born cameras, so cameras on the animals of interest. And largely, some of the work that I hope to be continuing here, which is cameras deployed into the deep sea. Now, starting quickly with drones, I'm sure probably many of you have used drones or at least thought about incorporating drones into the research, and they really have provided a new kind of revolution in, um, in marine ecology, at least people working in marine megafauna. All of a sudden, you had this device that was relatively affordable. For a few thousand dollars, you could conduct quick, rapid, repeatable surveys of coastal habitats that were great for spotting large animals from the air. This was something that may have only been achievable in the past using helicopters or 
low-flying aircraft are very expensive techniques. The benefits of getting that aerial viewpoint is it makes it very easy to assess large habitats to look at the distribution of animals or the abundances to calculate population trends. And an additional benefit is not always, but sometimes there's relatively little disturbance of the behavior of these animals when monitoring them from the air. So you can think if you're snorkeling behind uh, uh, an animal trying to observe its behavior, often some of these large marine megafauna are responding to your presence. Or if you're on a nearby boat, they're responding to the presence of the boat. But when you can observe them by drone, you can start to get more natural responses. As I mentioned, that's not perfect, but it tends to be the case. I now want to show just a couple of videos from some of our work using drones. And we've been doing lots of drone surveys up and down the coast of Costa Rica to assess abundances of marine megafauna. This is a humpback whale we had in one of our surveys and a little baby, a calf, next to it. This is a leatherback sea turtle. This is the same species that I showed that graph of. And this was actually the first ever footage that anyone recorded of a leatherback turtle by drone. And lastly, and this is my favorite one, one chance encounter, we recorded an American crocodile on a popular surfing beach in Costa Rica. There's actually surfers outside of the image. Um, and you'll notice on this video, every time the crocodile's foot touches the ground, there's a little colored mark. The reason that is, is because we're trying to model the movements of the crocodile as it was moving through the water. That's interesting because there's a lot of fossilized trackways out there for crocodiles, like fossilized prints like you have for dinosaurs, for lots of extinct crocodiles. We have the same. And several scientists have been wondering sometimes as to why there's very large distances between each of those prints. Well, from our work, we were able to show that crocodiles can quite happily kind of bounce along the sea floor and start to get some information to interpret these fossilized trackways from the behaviors of modern crocodiles. So we repeated some of those studies and we published several articles on this a few years back. So we got some nice footage and we got some nice footage and we got picked up by a couple of news stories. Um, the, a lot of the coverage of some of our crocodile work was picked up by The Telegraph, uh, a newspaper from the UK, and National Geographic picked up on some of our work on leatherback turtles. It was good, but nothing what we were hoping. So for our next project, we decided to go a little closer, a little more intimate to the animals we were studying. And specifically, we started working with animal-borne cameras. Now, animal-borne cameras can be thought of as like kind of GoPro head mounts for sea turtles. And this work was actually pioneered by National Geographic uh, and a guy called Greg Marshall, who used something called Criticams several years ago. But often, there's a limitation between many of these Criticams. The old models were very large, and often when researchers were deploying these units, the emphasis was on the amount of footage you're going to collect, more so than the quality of the footage you're going to collect. And this is because people with an interest in media often have a different interest to those who are working in science. As scientists, we might be happy with a low resolution image that lasts for a really long time, but it can start to give you some important biological information. But when we're conducting, um, when we're thinking from a media perspective, higher quality imagery can sometimes be a lot more impactful. So we started to try to hit a balance between the both. We used a bunch of diving cameras that we modified to temporarily attach to the animals. And they gave us this nice insight as to how these animals are swimming through the ocean. We decided for this project to start focus, as opposed to trying to sell a negative story, we knew we could try to show, oh, here's all the negative uh, conservation threats based on sea turtles. But for this, we wanted to try something a little bit different and wanted to show sea turtles in a relatively pristine habitat. So we went to the Bahamas because we knew there's very little plastic pollution, very little impact of humans where these sea turtle populations are, and continued with our work. The, while I've told you that a little bit of the focus was on media, or most of the focus on media, there are also, there are also several 
ecological uh, benefits we can get from the footage we're recording. By seeing what a sea turtle can see, you can start to get information on what they're feeding on, how they're finding their food, how they find shelter, how they find other critical habitats, and also how they interact with other species, as well as how they interact within that species. And that last point was actually probably the most interesting finding that came out of our animal-born camera work. Previous to this project, sea turtles have generally been considered solitary animals, or at least not very social animals. They'll form these big aggregations when they're uh, reproductively active, and they'll congregate around food sources, but very little has been known about any kind of interactions uh, beyond reproductive, uh, yeah, beyond kind of reproductive aggregations. What we started noticing from our footage was a single sea turtle can barely swim past another sea turtle without the two of them coming to interact in some way. This started to pose the question of why. Well, a lot of those interactions were somewhat aggressive, which probably means territorial behavior. They're trying to protect some kind of resource. You'd have one sea turtle sitting in an area, another turtle will come up, try to bite and scare away the animal or something similar. <clears throat> but we also have lots and lots of footage of non-aggressive interactions. We have examples of sea turtles sitting next to each other and like, gently rubbing their heads for a bit, or sea turtles sitting side by side, approaching one another and sitting in small little aggregations. We still don't quite know what that's about because all these animals were juveniles. So these are non-reproductively, non-reproductive animals. We're currently in the process of writing up the paper where we're trying to explain uh, what we think the purpose behind those behaviors are. But I'm gonna show a quick video and maybe you can make up your mind. So as you can see, we're kind of spoilt for pristine habitats in the Bahamas. We have a lot of uh, following behavior as well. When they're not chasing, they will literally just follow in each other's slipstream, potentially, maybe trying to save energy. And then we have slightly more aggressive examples. <laughs> What is interesting about that fi final video as well is there's actually two different species interacting there. This is a hawksbill sea turtle, and this is a juvenile green. And it's difficult to tell, but that hawksbill is about twice the size of the other green that's quite happily standing its ground against them. Okay, so... We started getting some really great traction again on these videos. We were picked up by The Independent. We got covered by a huge number of short online videos, 60 second documentaries, Great Big Story, Mission Wild. We were covered by a large American TV show, CNN. So it seemed like we were starting to figure out what we needed to do to start building kind of engagement. And with that, I'd like to move on to the third topic, which is where we've been deploying cameras into the deep sea. I usually start this section by talking about the importance of deep sea habitats and how abundant deep sea habitats are. They're the largest habitats on this planet, but also remain one of the least explored. But I don't think that's something that I need to expand upon here and to this audience. But I will talk a little bit about light in the deep sea. And as I'm sure many of you know, when we're heading into deep sea habitats, sunlight tends to decrease, which means when we're exploring these habitats by submarines or submersibles or robots and ROVs, we tend to bring our lights with us. This allows us to explore the habitats that we're looking at and see the animals or the geological features that we're trying to study. But just because we need those lights to see in these habitats doesn't mean that the vast majority of life that live in these habitats needs that light to see either. In fact, they've, most of those animals have evolved to live, or those animals have all evolved to live under very low light conditions, so have very sensitive eyesight. And this led to a wonderful scientist called Dr. Edie Widder, 
who you can see just here, came up with this idea 20-something years ago that perhaps when we're in the deep sea, a lot of the life we're trying to accord might be able to see us a long way before we're able to see it, and it's just avoiding us entirely. And this might explain why often when we're in submarines, submersibles, ROVs, we're not seeing all the deep sea animals that we actually know are down there. So Edie came up with a wonderful idea for uh, what she calls a stealth camera, and this was called the Medusa. It's this camera platform you can see here in yellow. Instead of using white lights, illuminators, and bright white lights, it used far red and very dim illuminators with a low light camera. The reason transferring to red was important was because a lot of Edie's work and a lot of her colleagues had shown that lots of marine animals, especially those in the deep sea, can't see in the red end of the visual spectrum. A lot of their eyesight is shifted towards the blue end of the scale, but they can't see it red. So if we start producing red lights, we can see uh, these organisms, but they can't see us. In addition, the device was basically a camera on a string, so it had no moving parts, so it was silent. And we know that lots of marine animals, even if they can't hear sound, uh, can feel vibrations. So that was another way to make sure this device was as, uh, as undetectable as possible. And then the final stroke of genius from Edie, where she also realized that it's not just enough to have a camera system that can't be seen by other animals. You also need something to attract other animals to you. And for that, she developed something called an e-jelly. Now, the e-jelly relies on the idea that the vast majority of life in the deep sea bioluminesces. It creates its own life. In fact, seeing as, in terms of biomass, there's more life in the deep sea than there is in all the other habitats. Bioluminescence could be the most common form of communication on this planet. Animals are using it to communicate between individuals of the same species. They might be using it to find prey, and they also might be using it to scare away potential predators. Now, one species that uses bioluminescence is a deep sea jellyfish called the Atola, and it creates this pinwheel blue pattern. So Edie created a device, the e-jelly that I just mentioned, that simulated that pinwheel pattern of the Atola jellyfish. The idea being that not only do you now have this camera system that the animals can't see, but you also have a prey item or a potential biomimicking prey item in the front with the e-jelly. Edie had wonderful success deploying the Medusa at a bunch of locations worldwide, um, but eventually she actually passed it to me to deploy for a while in the Bahamas. She had heard about some of the work that I was doing with um, communication and global outreach, and yes, and she knew I had a background in technology as well, so she gave me use of the device. Then. Thankfully, after a couple of years, we had the opportunity to go on a cruise together in the Gulf of Mexico, where we're hopefully going to use the Medusa to study midwater species out there off the coast of the US. We filmed a huge range, a huge diversity of deep sea sharks. We filmed the first ever in situ footage of lots of deep sea shrimp spewing bioluminescence. So there's lots of deep sea shrimp when they get scared. Well, it's kind of like vomiting, but they'll vomit this stream of bright blue bioluminescence. It's kind of disgusting, but beautiful. Um, <clears throat> but we also recorded something else that we had kind of hoped for, uh, but we really weren't expecting. It's a species that is so culturally important that it's mentioned in everything from Norse mythology to modern-day blockbusters. But... We've only ever seen it on camera a few times around the world. In fact, the first time this species was recorded was by Edie in the waters of Japan. Now, we often call the species the kraken, but as scientists, we refer to it as the giant squid. And we're able to record the second ever footage of this animal and the first recorded in the US. Here's the e-jelly, just down here. And the light's a little bit bright, but you'll see the squid approaching in the background.
because we know the size of the e-jelly, and there is a moment in that video when the squid's arm is held relatively straight, we were able to use perspective calculations to estimate the size of the animal, and we estimate it to be somewhere between four to six meters long, which actually only makes it a juvenile, uh, because full-grown giant squid can grow to around 14 meters. But the fact that it was smaller than the largest giant squid wasn't important. People seem to love it. We uh, immediately called up the New York Times, told them we've recorded something massive. They put us, or I want to say we were the headline. We were below Trump, unfortunately. Um, but quickly, we were picked up. That story got covered in 100 different languages in news stories around the world. I counted up to 400 different news articles and then stopped counting. So we were finally able to achieve the goal again of bringing something that for a lot of people is a relatively alien or remote habitat, the deep sea, and turn it into a global conversation. For the next part of my talk, I want to try to synthesize some of that information and explain some lessons that I've learned about communication from my experience working with viral videos. And number one, and the most important one, is global outreach requires global communication. As scientists, if we share our information in a bubble, 99% of the time it stays within that bubble. And the reality is, most people don't read scientific journals. So if we're trying to, if we have data that's important enough to share with the world, we need to make sure it's available on platforms where the vast majority of the world are going to read it. And nowadays there's so many options to do this, it's, it's almost becoming easy. There's so many social media outlets, blogs, podcasts, etc. You name it, there are different ways to reach ever larger audiences. And I really see this about reaching the audience that your work deserves. If you have some amazing finding, but you share it within your bubble, it never has the potential impact that it really could have. And this doesn't just relate to communicating with the public. I think one thing I've noticed a lot is the stories that I've been able to promote well on my own personal channels often get picked up and cited more and reacted to more by lots of other scientists as well. The reality is a lot of us are finding our news and even our science news nowadays on social media. Two, emotional connection promotes engagement. Once again, as scientists, we tend to communicate in terms of statistics and facts. And this is the fundamental, this is the fundamental backbone of science, statistics and facts. The problem is humans don't naturally connect with facts and statistics. We connect emotionally. So when I'm trying to promote engagement with causes, I think it's always important to build on an emotional foundation and then use that as a platform to communicate what you need to communicate and the facts and statistics you need to communicate. A great example is an article, an incredibly well-written, cited article in Science. And if I give you a quick example of one of these sentences... So it's about the impact of plastic pollution on the ocean. And that first line there says, we calculate that 275 million metric tons of plastic waste was generated in 192 coastal countries in 2010 with 4.8 to 12.2 million metric tons entering into the ocean. Now that is a shocking statistic, but I think for a lot of us, that your heartbeat isn't raising as much as, for example, maybe when you saw the the straw video at the beginning. And so when I'm trying to communicate these stories, I tend not to start with the dry facts. I think it's best to build that emotional engagement first and then move on. If you can show the straw video and make the argument that this is the impact of a single plastic item on the ocean, and then imagine that there's 12.8 million metric tons of plastic entering into the ocean every year, then I think you start to put it in a scale, in a context that engages with people. Same thing goes for discussions about the deep sea. I think often if we start to refer to the deep sea, it seems too remote, too alien. Most people, 
never think about the deep sea or never realize that the deep sea is interacting with their or impacting their daily lives. So when I'm talking about the deep sea, I tend to start with a subject that engages with people emotionally. The giant squid is a perfect one for this. So many people are fascinated by this animal. And if we start using giant squid, you start getting people's attention. And then once you started talking about maybe the threats that are faced by these animals and the reason we need to protect these habitats, you can start to bring in these wider conversations about the deep sea as a whole. Thirdly, positivity is as powerful as negativity. And conservation stories tend to be overwhelmingly negative, and it's obvious why. There's so many, so many easy examples of wildfires around the world and species going extinct and increasing amounts of plastic and pollution and other contaminants entering into our habitats. But we run this risk of sending so many negative stories that people can start to suffer a bit from apocalypse fatigue. So kind of the same thing goes with uh, the, the COVID crisis that we've been through for the past two years. Now, this doesn't mean that negative stories don't have an important role to play. And once again, using, say, the straw or the fork video, you can see that negative stories can be incredibly impactive. But what we've seen from more positive stories, such as the turtle cam imagery of trying to show these animals in pristine habitats, or, and I often think of the giant squid story as a positive video, it shows that we still have kind of monsters at the bottom of our ocean um, and surprisingly close to human habitats. That video is only recorded about 100 kilometers off the coast of the US. They can be just as engaging. So I think it's important for us to make sure that we're balancing the two. There's just as much room for positivity or just as much room for negativity as there is positivity. Fourthly, promotes individual action. And this is something that I'm trying to build more into my work because I thoroughly believe one of the big impacts of the straw and the fork video was there was an obvious step that each of us could take in response to that information. Stop using straws, stop using forks, stop using other single-use plastic items. And the message we tried to share a lot was that one less plastic straw or plastic fork or plastic bag doesn't save the ocean, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's a step that each of us can obtain. My other initiatives since then haven't had that same individual action response, and there's been less follow-up because of that. So that's just one thing that I try to keep in mind and I want to keep in mind moving forward. And lastly, you already have everything that you need. As I mentioned, this is a talk that I tend to give to public audiences. And while it's a little different, I still, it, with this audience, I still think the idea is the same. My story focuses on marine biology, and my passion has been trying to raise awareness about the issues facing our oceans. But all of us see stories and see things where we want to see change on a daily basis. And what technology has done, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has a smartphone with a camera on it, and we all have social media, or at least access to social media. What technology has essentially done, has done, has put the power to change the world in our pocket. We just need to decide which stories that we want to share, what change we want to see. I usually end there, but I'm going to move forward a bit and give you a bit of a sneak peek into some of the stuff we've been working on just for the last year. I'm going to be working on for the next couple of years. And this is where we've taken some of our deep sea research. Thanks to the, the giant squid video and all the press we received, we were able to uh, make several, or receive several proposals, funding proposals from Ocean X, Netflix, and Wild Space Productions to build the next generation of angler, or the next generation of the Medusa, which we've called the angler. You can see it just down here. It is a, a camera, so it's the same setup. We have our camera, our lights, our illuminators, and the e-jelly at the front. But we have a much higher resolution camera than we had on the, on the Angler previously. We're much more light sensitive camera, so we can even use, lose even less lights than before. 
it's small enough that can be quite happily picked up and deployed anywhere. And one of the big benefits of this unit, while the Medusa was so big that two people kind of had to pick it up and lift it around, we've been now deploying the, uh, the angler just on literally a winch that you can kind of pick up yourself and attach to any size boat. It records for around 18 hours, so it has a slightly longer recording time. So it kind of improves on the system at all fronts. And once again, we deploy it, or tend to deploy it, via a buoy at the surface, connected to a rope, and then the camera just drifts in the ocean. We built two units, and then eventually four units last year. And those first two units we tested out in the Azores last summer. Here's a quick insight into the footage that you'll see. This is part of a documentary that's going to be released in 2023. So this is a sneak peek. Once again, you'll see the e jelly right in the front there. Sorry about the lighting. The images are a little dim in the screen. Those two species that we filmed there are veined squid, uh, Lolligo forbsii. They're about a meter long, those individuals. That last clip is Tanigia danii. It's the Dana octopus squid. I'm just going to try and play that again because I want to show you something. Tanigia is the third largest squid species, and it's got a, a couple of interesting adaptations. On the front of two of its uh, tentacles, it has, oh sorry, in two of its arms, um, it has large light-producing organs for, sorry, I'm not sure how to pause this thing. <laughs> if I play that again, then I promise you I'll move on. You'll see on the front of two of its arms, it has big light-producing organs, look like two bright lemons. Um, and what's interesting is we actually started filming that animal largely under white light, and nearly always it was attacking the lights. And one of the things we started to realize a lot is from trying to film large squid, some of them, some of them we only seem to film under red lights, and some we are only filming under white lights. And Tanidia is a great example of ones we're filming under white lights. Okay, so we're now in the process of writing up some of the data and insights from that expedition. But we had another expedition that we started last, uh, over Christmas. And seeing as we'd now filmed the giant squid, we decided to go one step bigger. The, the largest invertebrate on this planet is actually called the colossal squid, and it's found only in the waters of Antarctica. The giant squid will grow to around 14 meters. The colossal squid has been recorded up to 16 meters, so probably the, the length of this room. That's mainly, or the width of this room, that's mainly tentacles, of course. But as you can see down here, for individuals that get caught by fisheries down there, even the body alone is pretty substantial. It's actually a much larger, heavier animal than the, the giant squid. There's actually a lot known about Colossal squid are surprisingly a lot known about uh, these animals, and it's because they often get caught by fisheries working in the waters of Antarctica. They seem to prey on a species called the Patagonian, or the Antarctic toothfish, and the fisheries that fish down there will actually occasionally be catching colossal squid on their lines, and they find lots of, lots of toothfish that have been eaten by colossal squid as they're being brought back up. We started a collaboration with one of these fisheries, and they allowed us to start deploying our cameras, the angler, onto their lines. So they fish via long line, and this is a very simple illustration, but they have their buoy leading down to an anchor. That can be anything from around 1,000 to around 2,000 meters in length. They'll have about 10 kilometers of line on the sea floor, and every meter they'll have a hook. So it's a big, full-scale commercial operation. What we've been able to do is attach our cameras to the buoy line, which means that when we work with the fisheries, when they're deploying their fishing equipment, they're deploying our cameras simultaneously. 
Unfortunately, we haven't recorded the colossal squid just yet from the previous expedition. We were out for three months. Uh, we recorded several hundred hours worth of footage, um, but we haven't quite filmed it yet. But we do have some other stuff to show, and there are some potentials to head back there in a few months. What we were able to film was an absolute ton of this species, which is Cyclotuthis glacii. There's two species on Antarctica called the glacial squid, and this is one of them that's called the glacial squid. They're different species, but they have the same name. Um, and once again, what we started finding with this animal was it seemed to love the white light in this instance. And we had a camera would switch back and forth from white to red, and we only saw it on red light maybe once or twice, and under white light we saw it on every deployment. We now have over 10,000 clips of those animals interacting with the cameras in different ways, changing colors, giving us a, a huge array of different behaviors. And we were also able to record this. So if you focus up here, once again, it might be a little bit too dark, but you'll start to see another squid. Yeah, it's a little difficult to see, but what you, what you can see on a, I, I can see it here perfectly. Um, that squid just predated one of these little fish that are swimming around. Those fish are Jonas fish, tend to be around 20 centimeters long. So we estimate that squid is probably somewhere in the two meter range. So we think we might have caught the first ever footage of, um, it's called the giant warty squid. It's a different species to the giant squid, but that's another animal that we've been just able to capture on camera recently. Um, a lot of the footage that we've collected there, as I mentioned, we'll now start analyzing in the coming months to start to look at distribution of these animals and behavior of these animals in response to the lure. And we also hope to be doing similar work here using our midwater cameras in the assessment of a lot of the MPAs on the Catalonian shelf. Once again, trying to estimate uh, abundances and behaviors of all these midwater species that tend to be very rarely filmed. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Um, I also have to thank all the organizations that have funded, supported this work, and collaborated on each one of those operations. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I'm working with Jacopo Guzzi. We're using the Angler camera systems, or hopefully we'll be using the Angler camera systems to look at uh, the impact of the marine protected areas on the Catalan shelf. So if we can deploy our cameras both inside and out of the marine protected areas, we can start seeing how that is influencing pelagic species. All the monitoring so far, the majority of the monitoring so far, is looking at the impact of trawling on benthic species. So we can also start to see how it impacts pelagic species. We're also going to be developing some AI technologies to analyze the footage that we've been uh, yeah, looking at and recording for the last couple of months and continuing with some of the stuff we've been doing. We have a couple of other expeditions lined up this year um, for more kind of large marine megafauna, mainly focused on cephalopod behavior. My pleasure. Regions, mm -hmm. uh, turtles, giant squids, pirates, Romans. You know, you do have some 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 areas of interest that mm -hmm. you attract more the attention. 
Uh, do you think, as a, as a scientist, as a, as a scientific society, we should uh, um, choose some selected, uh, selective like, uh, items, like, for example, plastic pollution? It's, it's, it does, you see the plastic, you see the turtle, and then you can go into the heart of the person. And we should use like, uh, those unique or, or specific items that we have. Or do you think that we should uh, uh, spend invest time uh, in trying also, you know, some people studying flagellates or, or, mm -hmm. or something that it's all complex to, to understand uh, from, from a human point of view? Do you think we should try to put like, you know, all those little animals in, on YouTube? Or do you think we should just select maybe what we know it works and then uh, keep, uh, keep on that? So like a quality or quantity? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Yes, so we, th there's a balance there sometimes between, say, media or science. With the science, when we put our science hat on, we know that ecosystems are built up of uh, a huge array of charismatic and maybe arguably less charismatic species. And that is one of the issues of scientists trying to communicate the importance of protecting species that aren't cute and cuddly and sea turtles and whales and things like that. I, my response to that is it is often easier to, to raise awareness by focusing on charismatic species. But I also think we need to, there's so much room for being smart about how we engage people with other species. And I often think it just requires a little bit more inventiveness on our behalf. A great example I can think of is, you know, tardigrades, mm. water bears. And people love tardigrades. They go crazy online all the time, and it's because they've got a great marketing campaign. They're called water bears. People think they're kind of cute and cuddly because they think of a bear when they see them. The people who came up with that idea, I think that was a wonderful way of starting to get people engaged in a species that might not be conservation or might not be charismatic. One of... I didn't show it today, but another one of my viral videos is actually, and one of the biggest one is of a sea snail. Um, on the beach I used to work with in Costa Rica, I ran a project looking at carnivorous sea snails. They would cruise up and down the beach and actually try to predate other animals they encountered. And telling that story of these carnivorous and that actually cannibals as well, because they'll eat members of their own species, it was a really successful campaign for a species that 99% of people who walk up and down that beach never even notice until you start to show some of these cool aspects of their behavior. So in terms of communication, I think it's really important that we, well, we are inventive because we do need to share that information. But there's also sometimes when it is easier to use say, charismatic species, sea turtles, as umbrella species to protect certain habitats or to start certain conversations. Um, uh, yeah, to protect certain habitats and start conversations because they are kind of inherently, they inherently connect with humans. Thank you very much for this presentation. It was amazing. Uh, I see that you, you are um, filming hours of uh, footage. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you said, I think, now in, at the end of the talk that you are using uh, artificial intelligence to not to spend hours of your life looking at the images. So all, all the tools that you need are already invented, or do you have to develop new tools to process the samples, that you, the, the images that you have? At present, so AI technology is very much expanding. Um, as we speak in several fields. From my experience, especially in wildlife conservation, most AI te technology right now is focused on each specific project and there's not much technology that you can readily apply from say one project to another project. Um, there are some, some great tools out there available for identifying. So if you're looking at footage, like the footage I showed in the deep sea water column, for identifying whether something's on screen, if there is something of interest on screen or not. But they tend to work really well in static environments where your background doesn't move. The problem is for where we work, the background is perpetually moving. So it's very, diff very difficult to, uh, to use some of these software platforms. 
For that reason, we are actively working on developing some of our own. And Jacopo Damianos and I were talking about this with people yesterday, trying to develop new tools to tackle this problem of showing of having hours and hours and hours of footage, um, hours of footage, and trying to find a way to analyze it in a timely manner. We're also currently using AI technology, and we're writing our first publication as we speak, where we're using AI tools as well to analyze the turtle cam footage. Once again, the way we've been analyzing that previously is we watch the videos, we record every time the turtle takes a breath, or every time there's another turtle on screen, or every time the turtle starts feeding. And we're now at the first steps of developing tools to, right now, our first step is just take a breath. The tools for trying to identify when there's a turtle on screen or whether the turtle's feeding or other behaviors just aren't accurate enough at present. Um, but yeah, so a mix. There are some tools out there available, but for the majority, it's individuals working on a specific piece of software, a specific model for their project. <laughs> Any more questions? Hey, thank you again.